The year is 2009. I'm staying at my dad's friend's house for a week in suburban Virginia, and, well, I'm pretty bored. Knowing there's likely to be a lot of downtime, I sit at the dining room table, dreading what the rest of the week is about to look like. That is, until the son of my dad's friend approaches me and asks me what I like to do. Well, I like to play video games, I say with a hint of shame in my voice. Oh dude, I got a game for you to try, he responded excitedly and then handed me this brown shaded game case. I was enthralled immediately. I flipped it to its back and got even more excited by what I saw. Knights? Monsters? Demons upon the land? What followed was a week of almost nothing but Rice Krispies and nine-year-old me obsessively playing Oblivion. But of course, all good things must come to an end. At the end of the week, I had to leave with my parents and return that copy of Oblivion to my new friend. However, it never quite left my mind. A few months later, I walked into a GameStop with my mom and lo and behold, that same brown shaded case caught my eye. Luckily, I was able to convince my mom to let me get Oblivion instead of Civilization V, which she was pushing for. I guess it looked more educational, I don't know. But that was the start of a long and loving relationship. Alright, now for those who don't know, The Elder Scrolls is a series of role-playing games that got started in 1994, developed by Bethesda Game Studios and published by ZeniMax. Oblivion is the fourth installment of the series and was the predecessor to Skyrim, which I'm sure most of you know about. It was developed over a course of five years by a team of about 70 people, all being led, of course, by the famous, and or infamous, depending on who you are, Todd the Chess Club Howard. Oblivion was pretty ambitious for 2006, with its large world to explore, radiant AI system, and the fact that Bethesda was literally making a game for new hardware they didn't even have access to yet. They weren't even able to start optimizing for the Xbox 360 until five months before the game's release. This definitely caused some last minute cuts to content, especially when it came to things like NPC population. But in addition to that, the gameplay is pretty janky, the NPCs usually look like boiled potatoes, and feel like they're all voiced by a total of like six people. This place was built by Raymond Cyrodiil. We had everything here. Guard Beautiful guard. Of the Empire, fresh it's me, your brother, then. Gilbert. You Any friend of the society is a friend of mine. Weapons and armor break a little too fast, the persuasion system kind of sucks, and there are ridiculous NPC interactions like this. Of the Chapel of Debella have all been murdered. No one even knows who did it. Be seeing you. Hello there. Good evening. The Imperial City Hello. itself is a wall. The Fighters city Guild is recruiting with again. Separate inner walls. Well, a bad way to make some money. If you've got the stones for it. You don't I hear you. See you. Do you think what happened to Kvatch Take could care. happen here? Oh, hey, sweet, lady of, oh, hey, sweet lady of my rest. Oh, hey, sweet lady of mine. I'll see you again. Yes, I'll see you again. Sweet lady of my rest. So fine. But ultimately, I still think this game came out on top. So, why do I think this is the best Elder Scrolls game? Compared to Skyrim, how could this game be better? Well, first of all, I'll fully admit that nostalgia totally plays a role in this opinion, but I find a lot of the ridiculous stuff to be part of the game's charm. And really, once you get past the funny ways NPCs look and act, there's so much more depth to the game. Also, I haven't really played through all of Morrowind, so I can't make a solid comparison to that game. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I may get around to finishing it one day, but that the combat and the draw distance, I just, I just can't. I'm sorry. For starters, I genuinely think Skyrim's quests barely hold a light to Oblivion's, beginning with the main questline. Yes, both involve you being a prisoner who just so happens to be destined to help save the world, as is the Elder Scrolls tradition. But while in Skyrim you're the Chosen One, in Oblivion you actually act as more of a wingman to the Chosen One, Sean Bean. I mean, I mean Martin. Now, you're still a video game protagonist, so obviously you end up doing a lot of the work, but for the most part, it's reasonably justified, since Sean Bean over here is just too important, and too sexy, to risk sending out on quests. Then, we have the side quests and guild quest lines. Oblivion is a classic case of quality over quantity in this department, whether it be entering a mage's mind to help him escape his own nightmare, finding a town overrun by cult members, helping a town where all the residents have turned invisible, or basically the entire Dark Brotherhood questline, with one of my favorite quests being Who Done It, where you systematically kill off a house full of people in whatever way you choose. 
all the while being able to turn them all against each other. It's her. Don't you see? She's the only one left. The only one left alive. We've got to get her before she can get us. The entire Dark Brotherhood questline is full of quests like this, where you're actually given a multitude of interesting ways to deal with every target, all eventually leading to a pretty sweet plot twist as well. My sadistic nine-year-old brain loved this and just can't quite find this in Skyrim. There's also no Radiant quests like those shitty contracts you get at the end of like every guild questline in Skyrim. Thank Christ. Every quest was written by like a person, you know? Okay, obviously most of Skyrim's quests are written, but the really interesting and unique ones, they just feel so few and far between, compared to Oblivion where it feels like almost every quest has something memorable about it. I think a big part of it is how the game goes about introducing you to the quests in the first place. In Oblivion, I never felt like the start of guild quests were shoved in my face. It really felt like I discovered most quests by my own merit, not by the game purposely pushing me to find them. For instance, the Thieves' Guild. In Skyrim, you're introduced to the Thieves' Guild when you first enter Riften and meet Brynjolf. This isn't really something you can avoid once you enter Riften, not unless you really try, since the moment you enter the town square, he talks to you whether you want to or not. Now can you just kind of ignore this questline after he talks to you? Sure, but the breadcrumb trail for the Thieves' Guild has already started by then. Now, compare this to how the Thieves' Guild is handled in Oblivion. The first time I played, I just hear some vague rumors about the Grey Fox and the Thieves' Guild, but no hint as to how to find them. This is because in order to even really find out joining the guild as an option, you must have first spent some time in an Imperial prison. Eventually, this happened to me after I killed some random beggar in the Imperial city. I, I, I was a troubled child. Then, after a few in-game days, a dark elf woman showed up and gave me a letter. Confused, I opened it, and lo and behold, it was a letter from this mysterious grey fox I'd heard so much about. So already the game builds to a payoff through subtle world building, and doesn't just shove it in your face. In addition to that, once you're in the Thieves' Guild, to rank up and progress, you have to go out and steal and fence stuff off of your own accord, and you can only access quests after you've fenced X amount of gold. So, as you can see, the guild already requires your playstyle to at least dabble in being an outlaw in order to even get an invite or to progress in the guild where you consistently break the law. I mean, makes sense, right? It's the same deal for the Dark Brotherhood. After I'd killed that random beggar, a small pop-up message appeared. At the time, I had no idea what that meant and kind of just continued on playing. However, at some point, I decided to sleep in the game, and that's where I was visited by Lucian Lachance and the Dark Brotherhood questline was opened up for me. This really freaked me out the first time I played, but got me excited at the same time. I, I think you can see the point I'm making here. To even realize that Dark Brotherhood is an option, you will have first have to have decided that your character is a murderer, or, you know, at least accidentally killed an innocent person. And with how it's set up, you could potentially go dozens of in-game days before Lucian even shows up, making the whole introduction to the Dark Brotherhood feel more mysterious, natural, and, dare I say, immersive. immersive. Speaking of immersion, that brings me to my next point. Oblivion does role-playing so damn well. Maybe not as well as Morrowind, because I know Bethesda kinda has a habit of dumbing down their role-playing mechanics every time they make a sequel. <coughs> Fallout 4. Regardless, Oblivion was thankfully still made in the time when Bethesda, and honestly studios in general, committed to more classical RPG elements. I mean, this was the era of Fallout New Vegas, Mass Effect, and Demon Souls. The RPGs were pretty hot shit at the time. During the opening of the game, you choose between 13 possible birth signs, which are basically the standing stones from Skyrim, except they're actually a permanent choice of the kind of bonus you want your character to have. Like turning invisible once a day, access to a powerful spell, or just some basic stat bonuses. After that, you choose between 21 classes, or custom make your own. Boris will even guess which one suits your character based on how you've been playing up to that point, which is a cool little detail. Every time you level up, you also have to decide between 8 attributes to increase, usually leveling ones most relevant to your playstyle or class. There's also a whole other complicated thing with the leveling system in this game, but we won't get into that right now. Just these three choices you make already put Oblivion miles ahead of any of Bethesda's subsequent games, at, at least in the roleplaying department. When you choose your class in Oblivion, you pick 7 major skills, and the only way to make level progress in the game is by leveling those major skills. So, unless you specifically chose Stealth and Marksman as major skills, you're not going to end up becoming a Stealth Archer like you would in Skyrim. 
Get this, you actually have to play as the class you chose in order to progress. Crazy, I know. Now look, I, I understand maybe that's not how everyone likes to play. I definitely had a lot of fun just being able to change course whenever I wanted to in Skyrim, as being a jack of all trades has its fun moments, and you can simply decide to stick to whatever skills are relevant to the class you give your character in your head. Ultimately though, when the game isn't designed around having you play as a chosen class, I, I think it really hurts variety and replay value. Like, for instance, if you decide to go ahead and play through the Thieves Guild questline as a heavy armor warrior in Oblivion, you, you can. However, chances are the missions will play out a lot differently than if you're already a stealthy character. So now you may want to go and do a playthrough as a different class to experience the questline differently. Maybe this time you'll be a stealthy Nightblade who uses spells to pick locks and turn invisible, or just be a straight up thief class. And you also have to take into account that in Oblivion's Thieves Guild, killing people on missions results in a guild penalty, so the questline is already built around actually being a, uh, a thief. Compare this to Skyrim, where pretty much every guild questline has a cushion for whatever class you're playing. Oh, you killed someone on this Thieves Guild quest? Uh, no, no worries, the quest is going to continue as normal, there's no consequences. Are you daft? I told you not to kill any of them. How much clearer do you need me to be? Despite your mistakes, I see more potential in you than half the snot-nosed footpads that stumble their way into the flagon. Ultimately, I, I know this makes the game more accessible to more people. Not everyone wants to go back and start a new character in order to experience something the proper way. And hell, Skyrim will always hold a special place in my heart, don't get me wrong. But I think I speak for at least seven people when I say Oblivion just does the role-playing aspect better. Also, you can literally craft your own spells in this game. That's a thing. Alright, so I already talked about how Oblivion's world introduces you to quests, but now I'd like to briefly touch on the world itself. While Skyrim puts you in a more tough, tundra, and forest-filled Nordic landscape, and Morrowind on a mysterious, almost alien-like island, Cyrodiil goes for a more classic, Tolkien-esque fantasy world, with long stretches of bright green forests, golden coasts, foggy swamps, and snowy mountains, populated by everything from trolls, ogres, and minotaurs, to wolves and mountain lions. Walking through the world, you'll rarely run into any dynamic events like the ones you'd find in Skyrim, but it's still just as immersive to jog or ride your horse through the world, veering off whenever a cave, ruin, shrine, or even an inn catches your eye. And really, chances are you'll find a side quest or some interesting artifact, no matter what you end up doing or where you end up exploring. And while exploring, you'll constantly be accompanied by the music, and oh dude, Jeremy's soul is really something else when it comes to video game music. From the three Elder Scrolls he's done, to Guild Wars 2, he knows how to perfectly capture the feeling of fantastical adventure, dread, or excitement. From the moment I started my first new character, the opening cinematics music had already gotten me hooked, and my excitement was tenfold by the time I left those sewers for the first time, excited to go anywhere in the world I wanted. Oblivion's soundtrack strikes a chord in me that Morrowind and Skyrim just can't manage. A part of that is the childhood connection, for sure. But I think another part of it is just the warm, classic fantasy setting Oblivion lends itself to, which inherently brings you the almost stereotypical, more woodwind focused ambient tracks, heroic brass tracks, and heart pounding percussive combat tracks. This is kind of similar to how the Lord of the Rings soundtrack works, since Oblivion shares a similar aesthetic, but all the while, it still manages to maintain its own unique Elder Scrolls identity. The people that populate the world are another upside, or downside, depending on who you are, I guess. Yes, the NPCs in this game look pretty horrible. But I mean, hey, if you're playing this game on PC, that can be pretty easily remedied with mods. Personally, I actually enjoy how funny and dumb they look, so I rarely end up changing it. Take that! Fall before me, Breton! Hello. How What's new with you? I saw some mud crabs by the water recently. I steered clear of them. 
ugly things with their thick shells and sharp claws. I avoid them. Be seeing you. Hello! <laughs> this was the first time Bethesda started using their Radiant AI system, and man, for 2006, this shit was pretty impressive. Every single NPC has their own schedule they adhere to, whether the player is present or not. From simple schedules like bandits roaming around their camps, to complex ones involving someone's entire day living in a city from working to eating dinner and going to bed, and sometimes even cheating on their spouse. This was a huge step for making Bethesda's game worlds feel even more alive and immersive. And one upside to that lower NPC population is that there isn't a huge number of filler NPCs, as a majority will have something to do with a quest in the game at some point or another. And while Skyrim ultimately added more NPCs to the world, it somehow managed to feel as though more of the existing NPCs were filler, especially in the smaller villages. Not to say filler NPCs are inherently a bad thing, Witcher 3 uses them to their advantage for sure, and the lack of them does come at the cost of having cities that don't feel as populated as they maybe should be, but when most NPCs can somehow end up as a part of your journey one way or the other, it retains a feeling that this is a living, breathing world. Speaking of cities, every single one in Oblivion tends to have its own unique personality. Whether it be the sprawling Imperial City, the mystery-filled Shadenhall in Skingrad, the coastal city of Anvil, or the rundown river cities of Breville and Leowin. All of these cities bring with them their own interesting stories and histories. One might argue that Morrowind and Skyrim do this just fine too, and from what I know of Morrowind, that's probably true. But in Skyrim's case, I think a few cities in that game kind of suffer and feel more like villages rather than cities. Morthal, Dawnstar, and Falkreath come to mind in particular. I believe this really comes down to a lack of walls and irrelevant NPCs. It, it makes sense that the villages in Skyrim just kind of blend with the landscape and, and don't have walls, but when the cities do it too, it just makes the cities feel like they have much less of a presence in the world, as if they could have been built two years ago. Not to mention in those cities, most NPCs don't have much to do with any quest lines, making them much more stale to spend time in. Whereas in Oblivion, every city feels like it's been there for hundreds of years, and that's in part due to its walls, which I think give it a more established presence in the world, and also helped by the fact that most NPCs are involved in the quest in some way. All in all, Cyrodiil is a quite literal centerpiece of Tamriel, and as a result is one of Bethesda's most interesting worlds to explore. It's only made better by the fact that you can explore beyond Cyrodiil as well. Assuming you have the Shivering Isles DLC, you'll also be able to explore the literally insane landscape of the Shivering Isles, and experience what is probably still Bethesda's best piece of DLC they have ever made. Seriously, this expansion is basically its own game, and could probably have its entire own video. But I think I'll save that for another day. For some people, Oblivion was the start of a downward spiral for the quality of Bethesda games. <sighs> and you know what? Maybe that's true in some ways. I mean, just look at the Horse Armor DLC. But in order to have a downward spiral, you have to peak somewhere. And to me, Oblivion was that peak. With its world, characters, game mechanics, and amazing quest writing coming together to create one of the most memorable RPG experiences I've ever played. While Bethesda feels like a shadow of its former self currently, and there's no telling if Elder Scrolls 6 will even be good anymore, I'll always appreciate them for giving us this game. I sincerely hope Todd and his team are able to really take a look back at what got them to make these lovable games, and bring some of that old magic back into Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6. Because honestly, if they don't, I think that may be the end of the road for good Elder Scrolls games. And in the meantime, I'm gonna continue to play and love this game that brought me so much joy, excitement, and sometimes even just an escape into almost every stage of my life. So, to the Bethesda of 2006, and to Todd Howard, member of the chess club, I just want to say, thank you. Any friend of the society is a friend of mine.